So I'm talking about TSX, so that's essentially um, lock collision or use, using um, hardware transaction memory support for, for doing lock collision. <coughs> um, and first, I have a question is, is anybody here, does everybody here know what TSX is? Or is there anybody who doesn't know it because, anybody who doesn't know it? Okay, then I will go over the intro because I'm, I, okay. In, in the interest of time, I might have skipped the intro. But, but if people are interested, I will do the end. So just very quickly. Um, so first, if you wonder what elision means, lock elision. So elision just means not doing something. And in, in our case, we not do locks. Or rather, we, we have a fast path to not do locks. So we omit locks, if we can, in lock elision. <coughs> um, and this is uh, some picture I stole from Dave Bosher. Um, this illustrates the difference between blocking and non-blocking. <laughs> so one, you have a traffic light, and another one is a roundabout. So you basically, you try to be non-blocking. So like the traffic light is the lock, essentially. Yeah? But in the, the non-blocking, it doesn't mean that you always get through immediately in the roundabout. There can be still issues. But in many cases, you can get through without waiting. Yeah? Um, and for example, if you have a lock, so the, the left case is the lock. Uh, sorry, no, the, the, right, the, the left case is the lock here. What happens, for example, so you have multiple threads trying to acquire the same lock. In the same, so they first take the lock, and then they have to transfer the lock cache line to the next thread and transfer the lock cache line and run, run the critical section and so on. So this is essentially how it looks like when you, when you run the same thing with a lock. And if you do it non-blocking or concurrent, you can run it all at the same time. And you can see if you see this as time, then you're obviously faster. So this is the, the biggest. And the reason it's called speculative execution, so things may actually go wrong because if multiple, because the reason you're taking a lock is um, there's some shared state. And so actually multiple guys might be hitting the same state. So if that happens, um, you still have to serialize in some way. But in many cases, the lock does not protect um, this is a very big lock, for example, to protect different things. In many cases, you actually don't need a lock. And what you essentially do is the hardware speculates, so there's a speculative execution, and it checks is, um, is there any, actually any conflict. And you only take the lock when there's a real conflict. And otherwise, you just do it speculatively. So you run everything in parallel. So and yeah, the another advantage is you also avoid the lock transfer latencies, especially. Um, when you have very fine-grained logging, um, where you have a lot of logs, then often the problem is, uh, what's binding you is transferring the, the cache line of the log. So essentially, communication latency, like the speed of light is hard to beat. Um, and log collision can also avoid this problem when it works. Yeah. And this is a very quick overview of TSX. Um, very quick, I'm, I'm leaving out a lot of details, so there, there are some references later, but essentially you have a new speculative mode in the CPU, which you can enable and disable. And um, it's implemented in, in the fourth generation core as well, so this is currently shipping um, into CPU. So right now it's available in clients, but in the future it will be on servers. And there are two ISA interfaces called HLE and RTM to specify transactions. And the important part to think of is transactions are best afford. So they're, they're kind of a fast path. Um, but they, they don't always work. So there's no guarantee that some transaction commits. So you always need to have some kind of fast path. So essentially, you cannot really do a completely new algorithm. You always need to have a, I think Paul made this point at some point. You need to have a, um, you can't just make an existing algorithm faster. That's what, what they essentially do here. Yeah. Um, so HLE, hardware lock collision, um, that adds two new instruction prefixes, which are actually, there used to be no ops. So in, in, if, you, if you run them on all the CPUs, they don't do anything. So you can just add these X acquire, X release um, prefixes to existing atomics. Um, and they, they will transparently try to elide that lock, which is defined by the atomic. <coughs> so you put X acquire on the lock and the X release on the unlock. Um, and if it doesn't work, then it just falls back taking the lock. So and this, is, this works on all CPUs, uh, well, all the new CPUs, so you don't need anything special. This is a um, legacy compatible interface. And the other thing is uh, called RTM. Um, this is, you have explicit X begin, X end instructions, so you can start a transaction and you can jump somewhere for the fallback path, so you have much more control. 
Um, and again, you, um, the RTM stands for restricted transaction memory, but you can also use it as a lock, as a fallback path. You can also use other things. But I'm mostly talking about here lock collision. That means you always use a lock as a fallback path. So some people are using other things as fallback paths. For example, you could have some non-blocking algorithm as a fallback path, or some people are using um, software transaction memory as a fallback path. Um, yeah, this is also possible but more experimental probably. Yeah. And there are also um, two more instructions called X-Test and X-Abort. So X-Test, what the name suggests, X-Test tells you whether you're on a transaction and X-Abort aborts the transaction. So that's the very quick. And then, as I was very, very quickly, that's the last thing. For example, um, if you want to um, elide an existing lock using RTM, this is how it looks like. So you basically have a wrapper around the lock. Yeah? So the, this part is the original locking code and unlocking code, and you just try to run the critical section inside the, um, uh, inside the transaction. So this, the X begin starts the critical, uh, uh, starts the transaction, and then you read the lock to make sure you synchronize when somebody taking the lock, and you check that the lock is free. And otherwise you abort if somebody is already holding the lock. This is very important to keep the locking semantics, and then otherwise you just take the lock. <clears throat> and the same thing when you unlock, you just check if the lock is free, then you commit, and otherwise you're gone. And I should add, this is a bit simplified. So if you had a real, um, if you had real code, then you would do some retries, and there various tricks you can do to make proof the performance. But this is basically the, the essence of lock collision. Okay, so this was just the introduction. Um, any questions on this so far? No questions? Okay, great. Um, by the way, I should add a disclaimer. I don't have any benchmark data here, so Linus will probably be unhappy with me. Um, so the one thing, let me just say this generally. So we, we've seen a lot of, a large, um, we've seen a lot of different, different results on lock collision. So we can see results from, it scales perfectly, until there's a lot of cores. Um, but we also see results sometimes it doesn't really help when you have a lot of conflicts, for example. So it depends a lot on the workload, yeah? So it, what, what workload you run, um, what, what results you see. So because often people ask me, for example, what number do you get out of TSX? And I don't really like this question because it depends a lot on your workload. And I don't really know what workload you're running and what it does. So what I usually recommend is if you want to answer these questions, just get on Haswell and try it out. That's really the best way. So, <laughs> okay. So, um, continuum. So, a little bit more. An elided lock. First is a fast path. I already mentioned this. So, you, when you're eliding, you're faster. But you can still go into the slow path, which is the normal lock. Then it's non-blocking. Um, when it works, when it elides. So, you, you don't wait. Um, it acts mostly like a recursive reader lock. So, that means you can... Um, yeah, so even if, for example, you already have a very fine-grained lock, um, it might not be a reader lock. So you might still get, um, if, if you're usually just reading stuff, so in the conflicts, then you might get benefits, for example. And it's also recursive, which causes some issues I'm talking about later. Then essentially it acts like a lock on every cache line. So you can think of it like the hardware doing a lock on every cache line. That's more or less how it works. Yeah. And it may always fall back. And I think that's the most important part. It, it uses the standard locking programming model. So, for example, there, there are lots of different ways you can do non-blocking. Yeah? So, from RCU to lots of compare exchange tricks to STM, all kinds of tricks. Um, but most of them require more, more work, more code. So lock collision is pretty simple. I think that's the, the main selling point. So you can't just, if you have an existing code using locks, okay, it assumes you already know how to use locks, yeah? So I mean, locks is not extremely simple, but a lot of people use locks, so you can use them. Um, so then you can basically just change the lock library to do lock collision, and it will alight, yeah? So you might not, um, so typically when you start this, it, it might work great, it may also not work right, and you might need to do a little bit of tuning, basically doing some profiling, see why do you get the upwards, fix the upwards. Um, so typically, I recommend at least doing, if you're not getting great results, just doing a little bit of profiling, because often it's something, something really simple. So you might not cheat, need to change a line in the code. For example, there, for example a, a very common problem that a lot of people have is either, uh, they have a statistic counter, which is causing upwards. So if you just 
make the statistic counter per thread, for example, or move the statistic counter outside the log, then you get a lot better. So, so something like this is often it's really simple to make uh, to, to, to take an existing log and make it perform really well in, in elision. And again, typically these chances are small, so it's pretty easy. I would say this is a, probably if you have an, a system that supports it, it's one of the easiest way to get non-blocking, so the benefits of non-blocking. So okay, that is my pitch. Um, so Linux implementation overview. This, so we looked at different things. The so one thing is um, because it's a speculative mode, so it's very important to have profiler support because it's very hard to understand speculation without some, some support in the hardware. <coughs> so I, I worked like on perf profiling support. So I recommend usually that people do some profiling because otherwise it's really hard to, to make sense of it. So, but I'm not really talking about the profiling here. Then the other thing is kernel TSX log collision. So basically just eliding the kernel logs. Um, I have some, some information on this later. Um, then what's actually I think is more important than the kernel log collision is um, user space log collision. Because frankly, in user space, there are a lot more crappy locking than in the kernel. So a lot of the kernel locks, I mean, there, there are some problematic locks in the kernel, but um, most of them are not that bad. So there are some benefits in the kernel, but it depends on your workload, yeah? So, but in, in user space, there's a lot of code which has very poor locking, like a big lock protecting a big hash table or things like this. So you can often see very large gains there. So one thing um, we did was to add it to glibc so that anybody is using ptred mutex locks, they can just, um, they don't need to can't just use the existing program. Um, the principle it's binary, fully binary compatible, but again, you might get better results when you do a little bit of tuning, at least some profiling, and see if you have any simple um, conflicts to fix and things like this. <coughs> then, the, the, we did otherwise works eliding custom locks in applications. It's primarily, there are some, some applications have their own locking. They implement their own locking, and, and obviously then just eliding the p-thread doesn't work. Um, and sometimes people also implement their custom metadata locking and things like this. So in this case, you need um, need to change the application to fix it. Yeah. Um, then there's also libitm. This is like um, what GCC does is like a transaction memory extension. Um, I'm not really talking about this here. Um, I consider it experimental. So I think the the standard locking model with lock collision is more important, yeah. And I think um, a, the most interesting target is applications with crappy locking. Yeah? But kernel is also on target, and there are some things which are good in the kernel, but it's, it's not the, the best target in the world because already has good locking in many cases. <coughs> so lock, lock adaptation. So one important part is, especially when you, for example, so, sorry, what's that question? No. Um, so when you, when you just use it with an existing program, that might be doing some things which, which don't align well. For example, system calls are bought. So if you have a lock which always does a system call, it, it will not align well because it will always go to the fallback path. Or you might have something which, um, which exceeds the capacity or something like this. So when you use it with existing programs, some, some critical sections might not might never, never finish the speculation. So what, what we do here is um, we use an adaptive algorithm. So where the, the, basically the fallback pan handler of RTM figures out, um, fi figures out that, the, um, that there are too many upwards or there are upwards and then falls back eventually. It disables elision for the lock so you don't waste time doing unnecessary speculation. So I see it usually as a safety net to avoid regressions. Another reason even if you're understanding your code path, it's sometimes um, pretty hard to understand every possible workload because you might even be, you're testing something, but there are suddenly some, some other workload might have a completely different profile, how it uses the lock or the thing inside the lock and so on. So if, as you do that as a safety net so that you, you avoid regressions, at least you will not get worse or not significantly worse than you were before. <coughs> um, so the algorithms I typically totally use are pretty simple. Um, it, it stores some state in the lock itself. Um, it has retry counts. We actually seeing big wins from doing some retries. For example, if you have a conflict, so multiple guys writing the same cache line, often when you uh, wait a little bit and retry, you often have a high chance to actually finish. <coughs> um, one problem is even our simple algorithm has a lot of tunables. It has at least 
four numbers currently, and there are some more things you can change, like there are different ways, for example, where you check for the lock at the beginning or at the end, or some other things, or how you wait, how long you wait for the lock to become free. <coughs> so we, we haven't really, I mean, we have, we have some data. Um, for example, it's, um, it's good to, to retry a larger number of times, like nine or ten times at least for, for conflicts. Um, but I, I'm still, I'm not convinced we have the best set of two numbers, so this is an open problem. And the other thing is, um, there might be some more fancy algorithms, better adaptation algorithms. For example, currently we only st store the state in the log, which has the limitation that we cannot store anything when you speculate because we would upward everyone, because it's, it's shared by everyone. Yeah? So we can only uh, account failure, but not success, which limits the algorithm a little bit. Um, if we, for example, did it per thread, we could do, use more fancy algorithms, but it had more overhead, because you have to have a hash table per thread and then look it up in the, um, and there's some other things you can also try. So I consider this an area for future work, better adaptation algorithms, and we might get some better behavior here, yeah. For example, it might be also possible to pass in state from the application, but of course that would um, require changing the application. Yeah, but that's still, oh. So, future user elision work. So, oops. Okay, I might have missed a slide. I think I have a slide on GLIPC. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so right now it's enabled in GLIPC. And oh, let me check. It's um, no. No, here, that's, that's no slide. Hmm. Okay. So, GLIPC mutex illusion. So, the GLIPC code was merged in 2.18. At least partially, I didn't get everything in. Um, right now, you need, it needs to be enabled globally at build time, so there's no environment variable also to set it. So any program which uses the Peter mutex is kind of light with it, um, but didn't make it in. Like um, there are no tunables. So originally, I had tunables environment variable to set it per execution, and then as tunables to set it per lock per mutex. Um, but they um, um, yeah, they couldn't, um, there was no agreement how to do the tuning. Uh, right now, there seems to be no path forwards using a separate library which implements the tunable and using a private interface to GLIPC, but it still needs to be implemented. <coughs> and the other problem where the, the, the read write locks, so I said support for, for aligning the read write locks, um, this hasn't been merged yet. So, one thing that I didn't predict was I had some issues with really obscure POSIX requirements. Um, to be honest, I never want to hear the, word, the term deadlock requirements again, because I think it's completely ridiculous. But there are apparently requirements to do deadlocks, which I don't always follow. Um, so my, my preferred solution was actually to say, uh, deadlock is not clearly defined in POSIX, because I, I mostly deadlock, but not always. Or sometimes deadlock, I call it occasionally deadlocking, and if deadlock is vague enough, I, I might be conforming. But so far, they haven't gone over to my point of view on this yet. <laughs> um, so essentially, the problem uh, what is that if you, because the, the elided lock acts like a recursive reader writer lock. So when you, when you take the lock and you take it again in the same thread, um, you don't necessarily deadlock, because it's like a recursive lock. Yeah? But um, there, there's at least some wording in the standard that, that yes. Yes. I, I could do it for the recursive locks, yeah. So, um, but the problem is recursive locks are not default, so you would need to change every program to add to recursive locks, yeah. Uh, yeah, they, okay. <laughs> so they, they, are, they are apparently, uh, so there was some pushback on environment variables, and then somebody did a survey, and they found out they already have 60 environment variables in the source code. But for some reason, um, I added two more, and that was not acceptable. Um, but I'm hoping that, that we, might, we can have some more discussion and, and somehow get over this. I don't know what, what else we could do. I mean, you could do a registry or whatever, but <laughs> uh, I, I think the environment variable seems to be the best and most Unixy way to do this, yeah, as far as I know. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> 
Um, the other problem was, for example, the tri lock. I mean, this was really visible. So, for example, when you take the lock and then you do a tri lock, you get a different return for a recursive lock versus a normal lock. Because the, the, the tri lock would always fail on the non recursive lock. So, we just, just avoided it there. <coughs> yeah. And I also lost the adaptive spinning locks. Which, which actually was a little bit of a pity because um, so the, the adaptive locks in some cases perform better, even though the implementation is poor, but they still perform a lot better than the pure sweeping locks because often the, the overhead of doing the syscall on every blocking is pretty high. Um, um, but unfortunately, the way um, due to um, compatibility to Linux threads, which was the one before, was also defined to deadlock. So, so I had to remove it from there. But possibly we can fix this at some point, yeah. Okay. So, I want, for some reason, I, 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 had, I have a wrong order in the slides here. Um, if you change the oh, yeah, okay. This is the right slide. The right slide. So, so the next steps. So, the, the GLPC mutex code was enabled, eh, sorry, was released in 2.18, so you can use it in the release. But as I said, there were some limitations. Um, so the next steps is add the recursive locks, um, so that at least they can, uh, there are no deadlock requirements, anything. But again, it, it would, I'm not really happy about this because it requires changing the program, because you have to, program has to say, I want recursive locks. Um, then get the read write lock merged. Um, do some more work on adaptation algorithms, um, get the tuning interfaces in. But I think, but, but really one of the lessons I learned here is that um, I, I might be probably biased, but I, I see it more as a failure of POSIX than a failure of elision because, I mean, if, if elision will be in the future, will be in, the, in a lot of systems, and if POSIX doesn't support elision, well, then it's definitely a problem of POSIX, yeah. So, um, so I think one possible solution might be go beyond POSIX. Um, so for example, it looks like the C++ 11 locking seems to have a lot uh, uh, um, less obscure requirements in the standard that, that prevent optimizations like this. So that's one possibility. But I don't really like it that it's C++ only. I would prefer at least support C2. So I might need some more, a new locking interface for C. Yes? There's a, there's a lock interface for C as well? Okay. Okay, that's interesting. So I need to check this out, yeah. So, um, so one, one other problem is that we, 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 was, we didn't predict this, but it, it hit a surprising number of, of programs is, um, so the standard POSIX condition variables, they don't elide out of the box. So actually, you can make them work, even with elision, but um, you would need to add code to the fast path of the lock to handle this, which, which I didn't want to do. Um, you can elide them anyways without any fast path overhead by having a new interface. For example, on Linux, you essentially have to do both the condition check and the lock on the same few text. Then you can relatively straightforwardly elide it. Um, so this, but this would require a new interface too. So having a new way to do condition variables. Um, I probably I plan to pursue that and make a proposal. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure it will be in POSIX or probably just have a library which does it. Um, another problem I also ran into is I tried to make it really fast, to so really tune the fast path code. Um, but one problem that POSIX pretty much requires dynamic dispatch. So you have, you have to have a switch which checks what lock type it is and do things. And if you actually look how many instructions um, it executes before it decides what to do, it's pretty long in, in GLPC. So um, I think with a new locking interface, we could, for example, use type dispatch, which would be a lot more efficient. Um, and I think C++ already supports it, but, but I think we should do it in C. It is possible to do it in C too. So you could basically get a lot better um, fast path. And also I think adaptive spinning should be the default. Um, the current defaults in TLIPC for even without elision and standard locking are not that good. Yeah. So this is the future. So enabling applications, just very quickly. So basically this happens when you have an application with its own lock library. So you need to do similar work like some form of the wrapper I showed earlier. You have to add or use HLE 
Um, for many cases, it's pretty straightforward. They already have a log library, and you just change the log library, and you don't have to do much. I mean, you still have to do some tuning, but you don't need to change any other locking code. But we, we actually ran into some applications which do some really nasty custom locking. It's spread all over. OK. Um, in this case, you need to identify the critical section. For example, there was a project to, to use Mo on MongoDB, and they gave up after, I think, like one and a half months because it was in impossible to identify all the critical sections. It was spread all over the code um, in really horrible ways. Um, so, so, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and typically, then, you still need some tuning. So I usually recommend at least a little bit of tuning because some profiling might give you big wins, yeah. Like for example, avoiding statistic counters, which always conflicts, or just make them per thread, and so on, this kind of big wins. And the other thing is, what I should add is, the tuning typically even helps um, non-elision, because every conflict, for example, is a hot bouncing cache line, and even without elision, you, you're seeing um, improvements from it, yeah. So, okay, now, kernel elision, I don't know if you've been waiting for this, so I have five minutes left for that. Okay, let's do it back. So basically, the strategy, I mean, in principle, you can do two strategies for, for elision. You can either um, elide everything and use adaptation, and, um, and the other strategy would be to say, I really know my code, and I just want this lock elided, so you add it to a specific lock. Um, <clears throat> so I use the elide everything strategy, because um, various reasons, I mean, we have adaptation, and it's really hard for me to try every workload, yeah? So it's really hard for me to even figure out what are the hot dogs everywhere, yeah? So, so I use basically um, the most, most of the nearly, except for semaphores, I think I pretty much covered all of the kernel locking primitives. So I added the, it's pretty straightforward to add the wrapper to them and do some changes, so it's not really a lot of code to do this. So one, um, I did some experiments, I mean, one thing I should add, the kernel is already quite scalable. So for example, in some cases for user applications, for example, one of the um, poster charts we had was older version of Memcached, we saw really big wins from the get-go, like near perfect scaling, but the thing didn't scale before. Um, I, I mean, I, I had some, some wins on the kernel, but I, I had not that many that helped that much. Um, because in many cases on the hot pass, people already did the work before. Yeah? They could have saved themselves the work if they had have, had lock elision five years ago, but they already did the work. <laughs> so um, one thing I found is uh, it was a great way um, to tune for, for tune for head cache lines because they always cost me upwards. It was, it's, for me, it's relatively easy to profile for them. So um, we actually submitted some patches to lower the head cache lines. Sometimes people added like new counters, which seemed innocent, but they actually are really hot bouncing cache line, which were modified by lots of CPUs. So I had, I, I, I had to do some changes to lower conflicts. For example, I also did some changes which um, se seemed to help in general. For example, I, I found that a lot of, we have a lot of macros, which are atomically setting and testing bits, for example, for the struct, for the struct page flex or for the buffer flex or for inode flex. And I found I got big wins in elision and even some wins without elision by just always reading them first before writing them. Because um, it, it looks actually more like more code. Or from, if you just look at the sampler, it looks like more instructions. But if you look at it from the point of view of the cache currency protocol, it's a lot cheaper uh, to have a shared cache line than to get a cache line exclusively. Yeah? from the point of view of getting communication inside the system, um, checking first if you need to write something is, is a very good thing. <clears throat> so this is, for example, one, one change I think we should do. Yeah. I had some, some wins in the rear with big locks. Um, so for example, I still need to, to push this out in the final version, but it looks like, for example, ButterFS is, is a big winner uh, because, it, frankly, it has currently very bad locking. Um, <laughs> And in some other cases, which we also traditionally had bad locking, um, for example, IOMU or so on, this works with small changes. Um, so I get some big wins there. In other cases, I had small wins. Or I had even, a, I must add, I had even a few regressions. Um, usually, the regressions were not very big. They were just a few percent. Um, I typically, I looked at them, and they were near always um, due to too fine-grained locking, so very fine-grained locking. So when you have really small transactions, like 
a transaction of something like 50 cycles or even 100 cycles. Um, and if you might remember, I had a talk last year. Okay, was, I think it was at Kernel Summit. Uh, sorry, at, at, yeah. Um, that, that even on normal locking, having too small critical sections is a bad idea because it, um, if, you're bound, if you're transferring the lock cache line, then you might actually get bound by the transfer latencies. And if you don't do enough work in the critical section to make up for the communication work, you're losing. So it's, um, in principle, it would probably help there to do something what's called lock coarsening. So usually batching things, making the, the um, making the critical section larger, you amortize the cost of the lock. And then there would be, you would also see more wins from the, from, the trans, uh, from the transaction memory. So the thing is, usually, um, if you light a lock, you can make the, the, the batching even larger than without the lighting. Because typically, there's a balance. Yeah? So you cannot make the batching too large, because then you start blocking again. So you get a non-scalable lock. But you don't want it too small, because then you communicate too much. But with transactions, you can make it even larger. So the, the basic overhead of just doing these things goes down. Yeah. Sorry? So when you have a really small transaction, like, like for example, 20, 30 cycles transaction, then there, there's a little bit more overhead. It's, it's not a gigantic amount, but it, you have something like 20, 30, 40% 40 more overhead just doing, because a, a transaction is a slightly more heavyweight operation than just a lock. Yeah. No, no, for example, if you, if you turn, if you have a really small lock, like 30, 40 cycles, yeah, and you're doing, you're doing it in a transaction, then, especially because the main reason is the transaction has to synchronize, has to do more synchronization at the end, to synchronize the stores, so it has to do more work with the store buffer. So it has a little bit more overhead. It's not a gigantic amount of difference, yeah, but you can see, in some cases, 20, 30, for small, for small critical sections, you can see more overhead on the, on the single thread, yeah. Um, this, this typically, this amortizes, if you have longer critical sections, this amortizes, yeah? Because this, the overhead is spread out more. But basically, if you have really small critical sections, you might have some more overhead. I, I, I'm still missing something. I apologize. Okay. Yes. Uh, right. So that was the case even before you turned on, say, say, the data link. Now you turn it on. Right? So now you go into the same exact block, but now you're going and you're having a lot of the elision on the transaction. No, but basically, so if, if you have a really small, sorry, sorry, Paul. If you have a small one, if you do, a, like, a, for example, you do an empty lock on an empty transaction, then that empty transaction is slightly more expensive than the empty lock. Not, not very much, but it's, if you do a lot of them, you can see some small regression, yeah? So that, that's, that's the only reason, so. So, so what you, what, if, you, if you have the right there in hardware efficient, then is it a little bit more expensive compared to normal? Yeah, but it only, it only shows up when you have really small transactions, because if you have a larger one, because the way an out-of-order CPU works, the, the, the cost amortizes, yeah? So if you have a, like a, even 200, 300 cycle critical section, then you typically don't see this effect. But you see it only on the really small ones. That, 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 that. So sometimes people write benchmarks where they just do, do the thing in a loop. Yeah? Um, so empty in a loop, do nothing. And then they say lock collision is slower than, <laughs> than locks. Which, which is true, but it's not a very useful benchmark. Yeah? But it's, it's not a big loss. It's not a big difference. Yeah? So, so, but this it, can, can show up here. Yeah? So, OK. And one more question? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
OK. So, yeah, I, I understand your problem. So, um, so in, in, in the legend, this is actually um, the, the term that's typically used um, in the literature is called lemming effect. So when you, because um, when you upward, you upward everyone, and then actually there are ways around this, but, but typically they're not used. Um, there's some, a lot of tricks you can do to, to lower the lemming effect. These are some of the optimizations I didn't cover at the beginning in the wrapper. So some waiting for the log and, and some retries and so on. Um, I mean, there, there were some arguments before that, especially transaction memory in general, especially when, when it does early upwards, so eager upward policy is that um, it might not perform all that well on an extremely high load. But at least we haven't seen that problem so far very much. Yeah? But um, <coughs> I would say it's mostly open. So people have to try it out and see what really happens. Yeah? It's, it's really hard to predict. My suspicion is that if you have this problem, that you might do a, with some tuning, you might get around a lot of it. But, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there, there, are various, there are various techniques to get out of the lemming effect. Um, but the, the, the problem is, like in more general, for example, if, if you, um, something might change in your workload and nobody never alights for some stupid reason. You en enable some tracing or whatever, and it always causes conflict. Yeah? Uh, in this case, this is, I think, this is the harder problem if you're a capacity panning problem. Yeah? So um, yeah, I think that people have to try it out. Yeah? This is something that still needs to be. Um, but I mean, we, we haven't seen any showstoppers so far like this, yeah. So, so it's um, so far it's I'm optimistic. <laughs> it's, yeah. um, so I, I don't think I have enough time, but I had a list of stuff which I ran into in the kernel. Um, if you want, you can read it. Um, but otherwise, we can do just do more questions or yeah, or chat the next talk. Yeah. But if there are any more questions um, on the listen. Okay, no more questions? Okay, thank you.